Um, today's blog, I'd like to entitle it, Get Off Your Butts, um, or God Wants to Deal With Your Butts Today. But I don't spell it B-U-T-T-S, but B-U-T-S. And I want to go through the scripture uh, and go through um, different places in the scripture where it seems like there's a, a certain statement, a positive statement in some sense, but it, there's this but that stops it from being fully what the Lord wants. And uh, so I just want to go through the scriptures and, and see if uh, this applies to us, and if it does, maybe we can get off our butts and get on to what he's trying to say to us. <clears throat> First scripture I want to look at is in 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 1. And it says this, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man. He was a great man with his master, and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor. And here it is. But he was a leper. Now, if you know the story, you know that uh, there was this Jewish girl that was a captive, and she recommended to him that he go to um, Israel, and he talked to a prophet that was there, and, um, and, and that she said he could heal you. So he goes down there, and he goes, and he meets with, uh, the prophet, but the prophet doesn't come to the door, the servant does, and um, uh, the servant, uh, the Naaman, this great man, this honorable man, this, this incredible leadership, incredible position of power, <clears throat> uh, he gets upset because the prophet doesn't come to the door, he just tells the servant what to do, and he, he says, you know, uh, I expected him to do come out, clap his hands together, and this great miracle happened. But instead, you're telling me to go wash in the River Jordan, and there are other cleaner rivers in Syria. And so we see that the real but here is not that he was just a leper. It was his pride. And his pride made him... Uh, uh, hate being a leper because he was he was known and he was seen and he was honorable and he wanted to add one more thing to his resume and that was that that he was beautiful that he was handsome that there was no flaw then everything was all in order as far as the way people looked at him and uh, so his pride drove him to start to leave and not to get the answer <coughs> And, you know, there are a lot of great people, and they, they, have, they have great positions, and they have great power, but, but they have this but problem, and it is, uh, uh, in this case, it was being a leper, but it was more than that. It was, it was his pride. And, and when I was looking at this story, the Holy Spirit said to me, how would this story be written if that was you back then? Would this story be written any different than what it is right now? And uh, he said, would you have accepted all the honor and the position I gave you, but would you have just wrestled against being a leper? Or, And the Spirit was talking to me, and he said, or could you be Jesus' leper? Could you be Jesus' leper? And he said, he said, could you sit down at a table with Jesus and, and never bring up the fact that you were a leper and only listen to what he had to say and the things that rolled from his heart into your ears and to appreciate that and and to not bring up the fact that you were a leper because uh, if it was important to Jesus he would bring it up he would bring it up and he would say one day um, you know we need to do something about this leprosy problem and he would reach and touch and and heal you heal me um, and uh, I realize that there are so many buts that stand in our way of being all that the Lord would want. 
and, and coming to all that is really in his heart, that, that we have pride and so we want this to be taken away because it makes me look bad. And we, we have this pride that says, well, I want, I want to look even better than what I do instead of, like I said, just, could we just be Jesus' leper? And that's what the Holy Spirit said to me. He said, Randy, could you just be Jesus' leper? and enjoy the Word and enjoy His heart. Do you have to have everything perfect according to the earth? And um, so anyway, that the, you know, that's how the Lord really began to deal. <laughs> how he, he began to uh, deal with my butt. <laughs> that, it was, that was me. He wasn't talking about name, and He was talking about me. And then in Genesis chapter 11 and verse 29 and 30, uh, and Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the daughter, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarah was barren; she had no child. And so, the, this is again thrown in there as a but. This is this is okay. You're you're. For God's sake, you're married to Abraham. He's going to be one of the most famous people in the Bible. Does our issue at the moment have to be in the forefront? Can we be, in this case, can we be with our husband while he's with the Lord? And, uh, and the Lord will bring us to that time. And the Lord did bring them to that time, but it wasn't the timing that they wanted because God had to deal with their butts. They had to deal with their pride and their stuff and all of the things that turned their, their attention away from the fact that this man was going to be called the friend of God. And yet there's this issue. It's always this issue that's hanging in the way and stopping full, free openness. Can't... You know, uh, I could hear the Holy Spirit saying to Sarah, "Could you be, could you be Jesus's barren bride? Could you be His barren one? Can you be with Him and just hear what flows from His heart? And if He brings it up, then He'll take care of it. And if not, let's just hear what He has to say." So then, also in Genesis, and I have several here in Genesis. So Genesis 19. Uh, verse 24 through 26. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven and overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. And so here's, here is her situation. Here is her butt in this situation. And that is that she's that, that the place that she was at was Sodom and Gomorrah. It almost doesn't get any worse. And so the Lord delivers them out of that, delivers them out of it, and he, he destroys all that is not of him. And yet she's looking back, but she's looking back. But, uh, but his wife looked back from behind him. Not just looked back, but from behind him. And she became a pillar of salt, and and so again there was okay. What is what is the but in that situation? What is the particulars? There was something something back there that drew her heart instead of forward. And we know that Lot and his his wife, you know, in that whole situation, none of it really turned out that well. But what if it could have turned out well if there hadn't have been this but and and the others that came along. Um, but but it's this it's these stories that come to us and there's some something some enigma some ailment some lack that becomes everything to us and in this case caused her to look back when the Lord just wanted her to walk out of there and then uh, last one example in Genesis is Genesis 50 verse 18 through 21. This is talking about Joseph and his brothers. <clears throat> and his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we are thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for, I am, in, I, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good 
to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. And so you have this fly in the ointment of this glorious reunion um, where where a picture of Jesus here, where we're being brought into his heart, not just into Christianity or salvation or whatever. We're being brought into his heart, and he's uh, uh, and um, he has made it his determination that they would be one again, a family again. Uh, but as for you, you thought evil against me, and. Uh, and those things can eat on us, our guilt, our failures, our, the things that we've uh, done wrong in the past. And they begin to guide uh, our thinking in relationship to the Lord. And they begin to uh, unsettle us uh, and, and uh, continue to eat on us. And uh, the Lord is ready for us to, to move past those things. And not just say, I'm forgiven and I forget it. No, that's what, I know that's the common thing in Christianity. I think Jesus wants more than that. I think he wants, he's not going, well, get hold of forgiveness. He's saying, get hold of my heart in this situation. I mean, I will nourish you. I will, I will nourish your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly unto them. And to see that, that there was something in his heart that he wanted. <laughs> And the music, I had it cued just for that moment, so that we would arise, <laughs> my beloved, and uh, be with the Lord instead of down in the dirt, you know. And uh, it's funny because that's really what Song of Solomon was about. Arise, my beloved, and come and be with the Lord instead of where you're at with your sorrows and, and your things such as that. So then I have just two more uh, actually, one more along this line, and then I want to share um, another angle of of these butts from the Lord's view, and how how they should be affecting us instead of how the ones that we're discussing here. So, one more along this line. It's Exodus chapter four, verse one through seven. Um, and Moses answered and said, "But." And this is, this is the Lord saying, Go, talk to Pharaoh, and deliver my people. And this is Moses' answer. And Moses answered and said, But, but, you know. And Jesus is saying, Get off your butts. and Get with me. But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses uh, uh, fled before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. And that rod began to be the tool, as it were, the vehicle of standing with the Lord instead of with his butts and standing with the Lord and smiting the Red Sea and having it open up and, and, and using it constantly because it, it was a change within him where this, his butts were not going to be an issue anymore. So I want to just um, close with, uh, actually, um, actually I've got several more scriptures, but we'll see how much time we got. Um, I got one more along the line of uh, negative, and this is uh, some some long scriptures. It's out of Judges chapter one, and I'll just read an assortment of scriptures. But I want you to notice the word, the prevalence of the word "but." And the Lord was with Judah, and He drove drove out the inhabitants of the mountain. But talking about Judah now. Judah drove out the inhabitants, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley, because they had chariots of iron. The Lord was with Judah, and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but he couldn't drive out these inhabitants, because they had chariots of iron. But they had chariots of iron, was the word, right there, but could not. And they gave Hebron unto Caleb, as Moses said, and he expelled thence the three sons of Anak. 
Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sheon and her towns, nor Tanakh and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Eblim and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land, meaning the land of Manasseh. Uh, and it came to pass, uh, when Israel was strong, that they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly drive them out. So when they got strength, they didn't drive them out like God said. They made them serve, them, serve their own purposes and stuff. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, nor the inhabitants of Nahola, but the Canaanites dwelt among them and became tributaries. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Achor, nor the inhabitants of Sidon, nor of Abla, nor of Exib, nor of Helba, nor of Aphig, nor of Rehob. But the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Neither did Nathalai drive out the inhabitants of Bethshemesh, nor the inhabitants of Bethanath. But he dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Bethshemesh and of Beth Bethanath became tributaries unto them. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. But the Amorites would dwell in Mount Heres in Ajalon and in Seabim. Yet the hand of the house of Joseph prevailed so that they became tributaries. And so you have this situation where there, there's all these buts that are just offhand. One, two, three, four, five, six at least. Dealing with all of Israel, basically all of Israel. They didn't, you know, God said, the land is yours, drive out the inhabitants, I give you this ability. And they didn't drive them all out, they just made them servants. And so, to, to do that, to, to try to make servant your enemies, is, is, to, is to approach it with no cross. It's just making your flesh subservient to you as best as you can, but they're always going to be enemies, and they're always going to act up. And so that leads me to Romans 7. And, uh, and now for the, some of the positive side. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do I allow not, but what I would do, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. And so you begin to see the same enemies are the real enemies he's talking about. And this but, this but, but I am carnal, but I am leprous, but I am. And they're all excuses in, until you come to the cross. And when the cross of, is affected, then there's a death. That I would do good, but how to, but how to perform it? I know not. Uh, I, when I want to do right, uh, but sin, it's not me, but sin that dwelleth in me. All these inhabitants at the cross, that Jesus at the cross dealt with, these enemies, and Christianity continues to live with the butts in these situations. And then finally, turning that spirit around so that we can see it now in the Lord. This is 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 12. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet mm -hmm. not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. So here you have the exact opposite. You have problems, you have leprosy, you have barrenness, as it were, but it's not destroying them. It's, it's as if Naaman said, Lord, I'll be with you in this, and this will not deter me because you, you know, because you're my life. But, you know, and this is what he goes on to say, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Um, um, for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, 
that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. And here is an embrace of death working and of negative things coming our way, but, but we're not in despair, but we're not forsaken, but we're, you know, and as a matter of fact, but we're always bearing about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus might come forth in others and for others. And so we bear these things. We bear them to the glory of God. And if we, we, we fellowship in the face of Jesus. And if he wants to turn those things, he can turn them. In the meantime, we bear the cross with him. It's as if we're crucified, one of those thieves crucified on the cross next to him. And we're crucifixion brothers. We're crucifixion brothers set to this end and to, and to, and to go this route for Jesus. Father, we just ask your spirit to breathe into us the life of the, the lamb and the life of the crucified Lord Jesus, the life of the crucified Messiah, so that we can... We can not only bear these things, but that we can live above them. And in so doing, even though we're not, we're not chasing them off, we're allowing life to come to others, Father. Father, make it real in us, in Jesus' name.